I guess we're going to get started. Um, on behalf of Jenny Haynes, who's the region of the Captain Joshua Honey chapter of the DAR and of the and Colonel Richard Summers chapter of the SAR, we want to welcome you today and uh, we're happy we all made it out in the bad weather and to see Jim here. Um, but before I turn it over to Jim, I want to give Tim five minutes to tell you about the skirmish that took place here. Uh, because this is a Revolutionary War site, so we're here to talk about the Revolutionary War. So, Tim? Okay, so who is in the back? Uh, Joseph, can you stand in the doorway, please? Well, we're honored to have Jim Stemple here today, noted author, he not only was nonfiction, but uh, fiction, um, but really, his expertise is in the Revolutionary War and the Civil War, and since we're DAR and SAR. We chose the revolution. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jim, we're really happy you're here today, and uh, thank you for coming. And sure. Turn it over to you. If you want the mic, you can take Okay, I think I'm good. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yes. And can everybody see the screen? Yeah. Okay, I'm, we're just going to have some maps up there that are going to help understand what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, again, my name is Jim Stempel. I want to thank you for coming this morning. I want to thank you in particular for your interest in history. Today I'm going to be talking about Washington's 1777 campaign in New Jersey. And by and large, this campaign has been essentially lost to history. Now you might find, think that that's a pretty odd thing to say, given that the Revolutionary War has been picked over for 250 years by historians. But it's true, and I'm going to be able to show you, not only that it was lost, but it was an extremely important period of time. During the Revolution, here in New Jersey, a lot of things happened. And we'll be able to explain that to you today. Um, now, the, the common conception of this period of time is um, the beginning is something very dramatic everyone here remembers, which is Washington's crossing of the Delaware River, Christmas night, 1776, marches on Trenton, has a fantastic victory. A few days later, he also attacks Princeton, wins there again, two stunning victories for the American side. And after that, it seems to disappear. The Revolutionary War seems to go into hibernation until Washington reappears around Philadelphia, the American capital, late fall 1777, to defend the capital against the British who were marching up through Maryland and Delaware. But that's not at all what happened. Actually, there's an enormous amount going on in New Jersey. A lot of fighting and a lot of casualties are taking place. Now, to, to show you how much was done and, and how violent this period of time is. We go to the New York campaign of 1776, which is pretty well known. I'm talking about the Battle of Long Island, White Plains, Fort Washington, Fort Lee, that entire period of time, about six months. <coughs> Excuse me. During that period of time, the British suffered about 1,500 casualties. Now, that's a fairly significant amount. But in New Jersey, what we discovered as we really started doing a lot of research over this period, we had about 132 um, engagements fought just in central New Jersey. That excludes the kinds of uh, mil militia actions that Tim was talking about that were happening in all other places. I'm just talking about central New Jersey. And during that period of time, the British suffered about 3,300 casualties, over twice what they suffered in New York during an extremely well-known campaign. So then the question comes up, well, if there's that much fighting and that many casualties, how come we don't know about it? So that's what we're going to talk about today as to why that took place. Okay? So to begin with, we're going to, we're going to go to the central or the theater of action for this. Okay. This is a map of central New Jersey today, as, as you all are probably pretty familiar with, right? All right, we have Elizabeth, Bayonne, Woodbridge, um, New Brunswick is over here, um, Piscataway. Most people know the area pretty well. All right, there's the Great Swamp National Refuge, Newark up top. But this is, this is New Jersey of today. And the New Jersey we're dealing with in 1777 is a radically different place. So what we're going to try to do is give you a feel for what New Jersey was like in 1777, uh, and understand that the, the New Jersey then really played into 
uh, what was going on and how, how this happened. So I'm going to take you a little bit back in time to um, the New Jersey, the central New Jersey of 1777. And what you might see is that this is fairly different, not only in terms of the number of towns and villages, but the number that the names of the towns and villages have changed. Rawway is gone in favor of its original name of Spank Town. Um, you have Quibble Town, and you have uh, Samp Town, Connecticut Farms, a whole bunch of new places. There's a large area called Ash Swamp that by and large doesn't even exist anymore. So this is the New Jersey of 1777. Today's New Jersey has about 9,300,000 in population. The New Jersey of 1777 had at best 125,000 people. And they're scattered all over the state from top to bottom. Basically, there are no large cities, there are no large towns. New Jersey is essentially an agrarian community. A lot of different religions live there. It's a very prosperous state, a very prosperous community. A lot of great farms, there's good farmland, good water. The people get along and it's, they're doing very, very well in this New Jersey, all right? Now, today New Jersey is called the crossroads of the revolution. And we'll walk back over here if you're a little bit more comfortable. The reason for that is it's situated between two of the larger um, cities in the country in 1777. Philadelphia is south of it, New York is north of it. Philadelphia is then the largest city in the country with a population of about 30,000. New York is the third largest with a population of about 18,000. So there was a lot of communications running back and forth during the war, hence the, um, the idea that it's the crossroads of the revolution. The second largest city is Boston with a population of about 20,000 people. And coming up in, in the rear, in the distant rear, is South, Charleston, South Carolina, with about 10,000 people. Now you can see none of these cities are large by any measure, today's measure, but those are the largest cities in the country. So um, now we're going to go back and under, try to understand what what happened in this period and how everything happened. We're going to go back to the beginning of, of Washington's crossing of the Delaware, which happens on Christmas night, 1777 or 1776. So he crosses over late at night. Uh, in, the, in the course, there's this immense um, nor'easter blows up. Snow's blowing like crazy. They march from um, across the river to, towards Trenton, right? He divides his command south of Trenton into two different uh, wings, one under Nathaniel Green that, that marches north, and Sullivan moves into Trenton from the south. They catch the, um, the, the Hessians there by complete surprise. And uh, it's, it's fortunate that the Hessians actually had patrols out, but the snowstorm is so bad that they pulled their patrols back in. The fighting starts about 8 o'clock. It takes about an hour. It's a complete and total American victory. Washington is ecstatic. They, they kill a number of Hessians, capture a whole bunch. It's a wonderful American victory. Washington, is blood. his blood is up. He wants to move on. But he takes a look at his troops and he realizes they're done for the night. Uh, they've had a very rough uh, period here to win this victory. He recrosses the Delaware and decides to uh, move on another day. But he has the idea in his head that he has the British on the run. So a few days early into the new year, into January, he recrosses the Delaware again and sends word out to all of his commands to concentrate on Trenton again. Because once again, He's convinced he has the British on the run, but he doesn't. He's wrong. Um, General William Howe, who's in New York City, gets word of the, the American victory at Trenton, and he cancels leave for General Charles Cornwallis. Cornwallis was hoping to go back to London to visit with his family. His leave gets canceled. Both Howe and Cornwallis really had the idea that the American Revolution was over, and that Washington uh, his, his, his army would fade into nothing and that the revolution was over. Now all of a sudden the revolution has new life. So Howe tells Cornwallis, march on Washington and destroy the revolution once and for all. Cornwallis, Cornwallis moves on Princeton where he gathers about five or 6,000 troops. We can assume that he's none too happy having his leave canceled. Washington is still a Trenton. 
The next morning, how, uh, or I'm sorry, Fort Wallace tells his, his commanders have five or 6,000 troops on the road to Trenton, because we're going to march in the morning. Well, during this period of time, New Jersey goes through some climatic oddities. And they have a lot of snow and a lot of cold, followed by some real thaws. And sometimes, especially during the course of the American Revolution, these things happen. It's almost like providences seem to be favoring the, uh, the rebels from time to time. And this is one of them. Um, so there's a big thaw. Cornwallis starts marching towards Trenton with the idea of catching um, Washington and de destroying his army against the banks of the Delaware River. But the road turns to total muck. His men have a very difficult time. Washington sends out parties to resist them all the way back. And they don't get to Trenton until very late in the day. All right, so there's some fighting there, and the British are able to deploy. <coughs> but a nighttime action on a road on ground that Cornwallis isn't really familiar with is a shaky and dead. Um, dangerous thing to do. So he decides he's going to wait till first light. He'll have his troops move forward then, and they'll crush the Americans and end the revolution. Well, Washington realizes how many men Cornwallis has. And he has a uh, meeting with his top officers, and they decide they don't want to fight here. They're in a desperate situation. But he has scouts out, and they realize there is, there is an opportunity to skirt the British Army on roads unknown to the British and get behind them at Princeton. So that's what Washington decides to do, because his blood is still up. He's decided he wants to stay on the offensive. He's not going to try to get back across into Pennsylvania. He wants to take the fight to the British. So remarkably, that night, the cold blows in from the Northwest. The world frees once again. So overnight, the Americans have the benefit of moving on solid roads, which the British didn't have. They march overnight, and they arrive at Princeton around dawn. They fight another great victory there and uh, defeat the British. And um, they get supplies there. And they get a, a whole bunch of information, not information, but they have food and wagons that they get from the British. Washington gives his army about an hour to rest because he knows Cornwallis is going to be after him. After about an hour, he begins moving on once again. And he moves up north of Princeton to Kingston. Now, we didn't put any roads on this map because we didn't want to confuse it too much for a lot of people. He moves to Kingston. At Kingston, the road forks. Okay? One goes up to uh, Brunswick, or New Brunswick today. It was called Brunswick then. The other one goes north up towards Boundbrook and then to pluck them in and up into the, into the, um, into the Watchung Mountain Range. All right, so we're going to leave Washington right there, and we'll go back and pick up Port Wallace. So his troops move forward at, at first light, and all they find is a bunch of smoldering fires, and the Continentals are entirely gone. Washington is left. A few people to feed fires all over the place, so it appears as though his army is still there overnight, which is a very ancient trick, by the way. So Cornwallis moves forward, and close, all the continents are gone. Where have they gone? We, we can't even, they couldn't believe it. They're, they're looking around at one another, like, where's Washington gone? Some of them think they, he's moved north up toward Bordentown, and all of a sudden they hear behind them the thunder of artillery and the clatter of musketry. Cornwallis turns around, and all this officers do, and they think, oh my god, Washington's behind us. He's at Princeton. How did this happen? Well, this is a disaster for Cornwallis, not only because he looks like a fool and he let Washington get away, but Brunswick is a major depot for the British Army. There's all sorts of artillery and supplies and uniforms and food and all sorts of things there. It's lightly guarded. Worse still, there's 70,000 pounds of Silver Sterling there, enough to support the British uh, war effort in North America for a long time. Cornwallis knows it's there, and now he knows Washington is between him, closer to all that than he is. So he puts his army on the road as fast as he can, marching for Princeton at the double quick, trying to make up for all this, because he knows if Washington gets his hands on that, the American war effort is taking, going to take a big boost and uh, the British war effort is going to take uh, go south real quickly, probably along with Cornwallis's career. Okay, so he's marching north, and he gets to be within about uh, gun range of uh, Princeton 
when Washington starts moving off and he gets to that uh, intersection. Now, Washington is there with this, at this intersection and he huddles with his officers. Washington knows about the money and all the uniforms and all the equipment. He wants it, okay? They all want it. But they also start watching their troops march out of Princeton towards Kingston on the road. And Washington takes a long look at his troops and he realizes, we can't do this. Our men are shot. They're done. They've been fighting and marching through the snow and the ice. A lot of these men, you know, it's, it's, some people will tell you it's apocryphal that, that you know, they had no shoes, they had no coats, but a lot of them did. A lot of them have been marching without shoes, without coats, and the uh, wagons that have their blankets have gone off in a different direction. So a lot, and they don't have much in the way of food. These men are pretty well shot. And Washington also realizes that the road between Kingston and Brunswick is pretty flat. And the British dragoons get a hold of them out there and start cutting them down. Everything he's gained through these two great victories could be lost in a heartbeat. So it must have been a very, very difficult decision because, boy, there's a lot there in Brunswick that really would have helped Washington. But he makes a very smart decision. And he decides he's going to move north. And, and Cornwallis keeps marching like crazy. So what we'll show you now is the, the march paths for both armies, the British in red and Washington's army in blue. Okay, so Washington moves north, stops one night at Somerset Courthouse. Again, his men have no blankets. The, the wagons have gone in the wrong direction. They sleep on the rocks with no blankets whatsoever in the, in the light snowstorm. The next day he moves on the Pluckman. He stays there for several days, allowing the stragglers to catch up and his men to get some food and to finally get rested. Even there, they're sleeping outside by and large on stones, on, this, on the hills in the Watchung Mountains. It's cold, it's nasty. He finally moves on through Bastion Ridge to Morristown, where he decides to put his winter headquarters. All right. Um, the British, under, under Cornwallis, he doesn't stop at all. He marches all through the night, through an ice storm, to get back to Brunswick, and realizes he's safe now, that money's safe, his supplies are safe. The British start throwing up and um, out defensive perimeter all around Brunswick that goes kind of all the way towards Amboy. The British now are in control of the area from Brunswick to Amboy and up along the Hudson River, and that's about all they really have anymore. They're in New York City. New York, of course, is extremely important to them, not because of the city, because of the deep water port. The, um, the, Brit the British fleet can come in there and unload all, all, all sorts of troops and supplies there. It's extremely important that they do not leave um, New York. Now, to understand what goes on over the next several months, we need to take a step back. Washington is now in Morristown. The British are now in Brunswick. And both sides have different problems. Um, let's start with Washington. Right? To understand what Washington is going through, we have to understand how the, um, the Continental Army has been brought into being by Congress. The Congress has brought the, the Continental Army back to a series of establishments. Right? The first establishment was really just to sort of adopt the army of occupation that was around Boston in 1775. They adopted it to the American cause. It's, it's now called the Continental Army. Well, that really wasn't much of an army. It was just a collection of, of various militias that had different uniforms, different ideas about how to fight, different order patterns, and all that kind of thing. But that was the first Continental, con uh, Continental Army. Now, those enlistments were up in 1776. So Congress establishes another army with enlistment period of, of um, January 1, 1776 through December the 31st, 1776. That's called the Second Establishment. Those are the troops that Washington realized in late December were going to be moving off. And that was one of the main impetuses he had to attack Trenton because after, um, after December, he may not have an army to do anything with. So that was the main reason he drove on Trenton then. Now, he's taught some of those people of the second establishment to stay on. But after he arrives in Morristown, their enlistments are up. And most of them decide they, they've got to go home and um, 
they go back to their families. Now, Congress has established a third uh, establishment for the Army by law, but it's nowhere to be seen, right? None of these people have signed up for this third establishment. And um, so as, as Washington actually takes command in Morristown, he's in much worse condition here than he was when he was standing at McConkie's Ferry on uh, Christmas night, 1776, because at least then he had troops. Now his troops are all marching off. Still doesn't have the food he needs, the ammunition he needs, the clothing he needs, or any of that thing. So he's actually in worse condition. What he has done is he's won two great victories. And that's really um, animated the army, and it's, and it's electrified all the people in the country who found out about this through, um, through newspapers and everything that's what's going on. So Washington's in a very difficult um, situation here. Now, you may think that this is a kind of an odd way to fight a war. That is, you have the commander-in-chief facing the enemy and his marching, army marching off, and no new march, army marching in. And, um, and I would think so. That's actually a pretty stupid way to fight a war. But this, we have to remember, this is the early days of the United States of America, the very early days of it. Nobody here knows how to fight a war, how to raise an army, how to supply an army, how to train an army. How to fight a war, nobody knows. So this is what we got. So the overarching problem that George Washington has here, so he doesn't really have an army to speak of. And yet he's supposed to stay in New Jersey and try to fight this thing. So I mean, I have a, we have a return of the Continental Army from early March. There are 2,200 Continentals under his command at that time. And they're spread out from Princeton way north to Whitby. So he really doesn't have much to fight with. At the same time, Cornwallis is in Brunswick with 18,000 troops, Hessians and, and um, British crack troops. So this is one of the main things Washington has to deal with over this entire period of time. Right? He cannot possibly bring on a major engagement. That would be suicidal. His officers cannot bring on a major engagement. But he has to do something. So what he decides to do is spread his units out in a, in a sort of a ring around Brunswick. So for, to, to do a number of different things. Um, number one, they can keep track of, of, the, of the British should they move. Because Washington is always scared that, that um, Howe or Cornwallis are going to make a move at Morristown and shove them out of there. And um, so they, they move out to there. Uh, now they can also harass the British. They can't bring out a major fight, but they can harass the, the, um, the British there, hence the title of the book. Uh, this also helps them in wintertime to, uh, to winter there because they can get supplies from various areas rather than concentrating, concentrating his entire army in one area where they would probably um, either buy out or, uh, uh, or forage out that area for food. So this works well for them. It also has disadvantages. His army is separated widely, and uh, it can be attacked by a, uh, by a critically thinking uh, uh, enemy might decide to attack these, these um, um, various positions and take them on one at a time. So now we'll show you where Washington decided to put these, these troops. So from Morristown, they move, they move out through Asheville, swamp, towards Metuchen, uh, Somerset Courthouse, Basking Ridge, Chatham. He sort of puts a ring around himself, to, to, like a spider's web, to get a sense if, if anything's moving anywhere. Washington has three major fears during this period of time. The first is that um, Cornwallis is going to move on Morristown. It's going to attack him and force him out of there, or force his army out of there in a major move. The second one is that he's going to move on Philadelphia. And the third is that he may move up the Hudson River and move up north to, to communicate and to cooperate with another column that's moving down from Canada. So that's Washington's problem, and that's what he has to deal with during this period of time. Now, the British, they're at uh, Brunswick. Brunswick is on this, the, the Raritan River. The, the British Navy can move in from there and supply people. Uh, so they have plenty of supplies, they have money, they have clothing, they built a, a defensive uh, fortifications all around there, they're sitting pretty well. But they have one big problem, and that is this. In any 18th century army, they move, if they move into the field, they have to tow their artillery on the limbers and, and with uh, ammunition carts. The army is followed by a vast line of 
wagons, uh, they have ambulances. All of these vehicles are pulled by horses or, or other animals, and animals need to be fed. So the British have thousands of animals here in Brunswick, but that's the one thing they don't have is fresh feed. It's not going to come in from London. It's going to be rotten by the time it gets here. Now, they could probably send scouring expeditions out all over, but by the time they got it, say, in Connecticut or Vermont or go south, it's going to take a long time to get it back here. So they're in desperate need for food for their animals, not so much for their men, but for their animals. So in early January, after everybody settles in here, the British decide, they look out across New Jersey, and they see the same thing, same thing we were just talking about. There are all these farms. The uh, harvest is in the barns. There's um, timothy hay, alfalfa hay, straw, a plenty all throughout all these farms. So they'll just go out and get it. Why not? So they, early on, they start sending out foraging expeditions. And early on, there's no more than maybe a couple hundred troops with a few wagons. Well, guess what? They get hammered immediately by American militias by marching with some wagons. And so they start hitting them everywhere they come out. Now, they're not just going out here and there. They're going out to forage all around the place. And they're getting hit every time they go out all around the place. None of this is making news, right? None of this is making news in New York that 200 British got attacked somewhere around Piscataway or around Woodbridge and lost three dead and 10 wounded. That's not making any noise. It's not making any news at all. But it's happening everywhere. And it gets so bad that the British start saying, well, you know what? A couple hundred men is not working, so we'll send out 500 men, and then get, they get attacked. And then they send out a thousand men on these things. Then they send out a few thousand men on these foraging expeditions. Some of them are successful, some of them aren't successful. But whether they're successful or not, they're taking casualties every single day. Somewhere along this line, they're taking casualties, and you're having all these engagements taking place. So now you start to see a picture emerge as to why there can be so many engagements and there's so many casualties, but no one ever really took count of all of this because it wasn't making news much of anywhere. I mean, it gets so bad that Cornwallis himself leads a detachment out on a foraging expedition from Bellingbrook towards, uh, I'm sorry, from um, Brunswick to Quibbletown with thousands and thousands, about 4,000 troops, crack British troops, and he sends out another 1,000 on a diversionary movement to try to lure the Americans away from Quibbletown. That's how bad it's getting for the British to get forged for their animals. Now, they're, they're not only that they're losing a lot of men, but their animals are starting to get weak and die. And they can't have this. The British army will become ineffectual if they don't have armies to move their, their wagons. So after the... Um, the, this goes on throughout January, February, and most of March. In the cold, the, this kind of fighting goes on. The British are taking a serious, serious casualties. In this period of the war, this has been called the forage war. Simple idea that they're fighting over this forage. The British need, the Americans have, and guess what? The British can't get. In fact, Washington uh, comes up with an idea to get all the forage near Brunswick and move it away into storage for his own troops. <coughs> so this is this is just a, a very successful period for the Americans, believe it or not, even though you haven't heard a lot about it. They prevent the British from getting a lot of forage, and they're, um, they're, they're forcing them to suffer a lot of casualties. Now, <coughs> by early spring, um, William Howe writes to Lord Chamberlain in London and basically says, you know, I think we're going we're gonna, to uh, move on to Philadelphia here in the spring as soon as we can. Because he realized he's taking a lot of casualties, he's not gaining anything, he's losing a lot. So he has to get out of here. The only decision he's going to have to make is whether he's going to march from, um, from Brunswick south towards Philadelphia, or he has to load his army up on ships and sail south. Now, they sound like kind of the same thing, but they're not. A march across land is much simpler, much less uh, costly, easier to organize and bring off. To load all of his troops, all of his horses, all of his artillery onto a fleet, that takes a lot of time, a lot of money, and it's, and it's going to delay things a lot. So he would much prefer to march. All right. So winter turns to spring, and the roads start to, to melt, and the ice goes away, 
And Cornwallis is sitting here again in, Bound in Brunswick. And right up there in Boundbrook, if you can see it, right there, Washington has put another post there. It's commanded by General Benjamin Lincoln. It's only 500 men. And they're sitting right there at Boundbrook. Now, Boundbrook is only more than eight miles right up the Raritan River from, um, from Brunswick. Probably not a very good spot to put a, uh, a post, right? Because as we talked before, this arrangement that Washington has has some really good advantages, but it has bad advantages because his units are separated and, a, and a, uh, an aggressive commander could attack one, move on another, move on another, and take them down in detail, as it's called, one after the other. Fortunately for Washington, he's not dealing with a very aggressive or um, um, creative commander in either Cornwallis or Howe. But Cornwallis is tired, I think, of getting all these, the, his men wounded that much and, and um, killed in all these actions. So he plots a movement against the American base at Boundbrook. Now, I'm going to tell you about this action, but what I really found interesting about it was not so much the fight itself, but the thinking process afterwards. Because it tells us a lot about what the British were thinking, and I think it tells us a heck of a lot about what Washington was thinking. Who was thinking about what was going on, and who wasn't. So, Boundbrook lays right here. 500 Americans there. Cornwallis comes up with this plan for three columns to march overnight. 4,000 tr crack troops. One goes all the way around. It's going to come in from Boundbrook from behind. One goes up the south side of the river. One goes up the north side of the river. Another small detachment is going to move off towards um, the mountains there and cut off the, the uh, roads in that direction so that uh, any fugitives from Boundbrook can't get away or any reinforcements coming in can't get there. It's a pretty good plan. He pulls it off spectacularly. At dawn uh, in the morning, I believe it's the 13th of April, these three columns all attack at the same time. And they completely overwhelmed the Americans, 500 men, not, not exactly a surprise. The Americans are shot down in, in minutes only. They're all forced to flee. A uh, man, Anthony Wayne, is there with Lincoln. They, they're surprised so much they both have to run off without even getting a chance to put their pants on that morning, okay? So they run off, and the British take Boundbrook. What do the British do with it? They pillage Boundbrook, Brown, which is just a tiny village. They take three cannons that he has. They run off with about 80 um, captured Americans that they have. And by noon, they just march back to Brunswick, as if really nothing really happened. 4,000 troops, and that's all they really accomplished. It seems like a pittance to, to, to do all of that. And it appears to me that, that all Cornwallis really wanted to do was teach Washington's troops a little lesson here. Uh, we'll show you. We're still in charge, by the way. Um, Washington gets word of this, but of course he gets it late up in Morristown. He sends uh, a courier to Nathaniel Green, who's at Basking Ridge, to go and march and support Boundbrook. By the time uh, Green gets there, it's late afternoon, the British were long gone. All right? Now you might think, Cornwallis would think afterwards, gee, it took the Americans eight hours to respond to this, and maybe I can use that in the future to attack another one of his posts, or two posts at the same time. But it doesn't happen, all right? Now, I want to show you something else that's even more amazing to me when I looked at this, is that I don't have the road system in this map, but from Boundbrook, roads move north towards Westfield and behind Quibbletown and Woodbridge up to Spanktown, where all these America, a lot of these American posts were and where a lot of the American troops and militias were moving. Now, if he holds troops in Boundbrook, which is already taken, and he moves a few thousand more up and starts marching behind those roads, on, behind those Americans on those roads. They will have the, the Americans fronted it uh, at Brunswick on their right flank in Boundbrook and be marching behind them, cutting them off from, the, um, from Washington at Morristown. And they'll all be in danger of being potentially circled and crushed. All right, so that's an untenable situation. If that happens, if that were to have happened, Kubeltown goes immediately. Which way can they run? They can only run up to the northeast, which is going to alert all of Washington's other commands. The British are behind us. We've got to get out of here. And it could have, this could have been a disaster for Washington and the Americans. But it wasn't a disaster at all because it never happened. Because it appears that the British had no real interest in that kind of thing. 
and they, they just never saw it to begin with. And yet it was obvious, if you look at, if you look at a, um, and a map of the area and you know anything about military history, the, the thing that struck me is, and I'll go into the Civil War very briefly, there was a similar uh, situation in the Civil War in the Chancellorsville campaign, where the, American, where the Federals marched behind the um, Confederate positions all along the Rappahannock River, and they forced them to, to vacate those positions, then they, the, the Federals moved across the, the river. This is the same thing. There's no way the Quibble Town could have stayed there. But the British don't seem to be particularly interested in it. But George Washington is, and it's really interesting. I mean, I read all of Washington's correspondence going in and going out of Morristown during this period of time for months. And three days after this happens, Washington writes to William Maxwell, one of his top generals in the area from New Jersey. And he says, basically, I'm paraphrasing, paraphrasing, you know, we can't let this happen again. We're going to have to pull our posts much tighter together. We can't just have guards around them. We have to have scouts out all around the British position to alert us of all this because we can't be caught by surprise like this again. We're too far apart to support one another. So Washington, obviously, is thinking about what just happened. And three months later, he decides to, to, to make a movement with his entire army, because he's thought things through. And he writes to Benjamin Rush just before he makes this movement. And he, and he writes and he says, an army consolidated and is in far better position to defend itself or, or against an aggressive attack or go over to the offensive if an opportunity presents itself than an army that spread out all over the place. So he decides he's going to concentrate his army, and he picks a good spot, and we'll show you. So he, all these, these um, detached uh, forces are drawn together in one place, and we'll show you where that is. OK, so he decides to move behind Boundbrook at a place now called the Middlebrook Encampment. Now, the Middlebrook encampment is on the first two ridges of the Wachong Mountains. It's a formidable position. From, if if y'all have ever been up there, you can see forever from there. There is no attacking it. He has artillery on the first line and, and his camp on the second line. It's a great position. It's, it's, un, it's, uh, it's unassailable, essentially. So that's where he moves for the rest of the time. Now, you can see that George Washington has been thinking a lot about how to fight a war. He has no experience in fighting a major war with a, a major army like this. But he's starting to think his way through these things. And he realizes, you know what? From this position, if, if Cornwallis and Howe march across New Jersey, he can swing down and hit their rear guard real hard, take out a couple of divisions, and move back up into the mountains before they could even turn around and do something. So he's thinking his way through this. Whereas the British don't appear to be thinking much at all, as far as I can see. Because there's a scenario up here, which I'm not saying they would have won the war here, but they could have caused an enormous amount of damage to Washington in New Jersey and to his position in, in New Jersey. So it remains like this for, a, uh, for most of the spring. There's still a lot of fighting going on, but it's mostly along the front. The British are still going out, and they're still being attacked by um, militias and the Continentals from time to time coming down on the mountains. But Washington is going to stay in those mountains. Twice Howe attempts to lure him out of the mountains by marching his entire wall, about 16,000 troops out. One time he moves out and he, and he puts tro troops down along the Millstone River with the other troops up around the, um, the touch in there, serving as a sort of lure for Washington to come out with the idea clearly that if Washington comes down, then he's going to sweep behind with the others, cut him off from his base, and destroy him. But Washington doesn't take the bait. That's all. He just doesn't move it. So the British march back, and they start moving into um, Amboy, because Howe has decided he can't march across New Jersey. It's been so damaging to his army. They've lost so many men. He, he can't conceive of marching across New Jersey to Philadelphia, he's going to have to walk, load them all up on to, to ships, which takes him a couple months to do, actually. And sail from there, he decides to go to the Chesapeake Bay and march up from there towards Philadelphia. He does attempt one other time because to, to attempt the same thing. As he's, he, he shifts his army from Amboy to Staten Island, and they're all 
coming up, and he has some troops in ambush still. And uh, as Washington comes down from the mountain, the British attempt to do the same thing. for Wallace marches up through Woodbridge towards Ashwalk with the intention of getting to Westfield, which has been outside of the British uh, lines the entire time, but it served as a staging area for, uh, for the Americans this entire period of time. Meanwhile, Howe marches with another column, again, behind, trying to cut Washington off. But at Woodbridge, um, the Americans have uh, Daniel Morgan's 500 um, crack shots. I don't know who knows who Daniel Morgan is. Daniel Morgan is a, a legendary um, American uh, officer, come up in, in a, a great example of the, uh, of the American meritocracy that's coming into being. Uh, Morgan was an 18-year-old kid, shows up in the Shenandoah Valley, not a penny in his pocket, develops a business as hauling uh, food and things like that, gets a contract during the French and Indian War to do the same thing, becomes a, a, a fighter in Dunlop's War, fighting against the Indians, marches to Boston as a commander of a unit of, of uh, a rifleman, a uh, select rifleman that he that he picks out, and all these men are carrying the long rifle, which is far more accurate than the the the, um, the, um, the standard musket. So Washington has given him 500 crack shots. They're waiting in Woodbridge. Morgan knows what he's doing. He immediately attacks the vanguard of the Brit of Walker Ross's column. Sends word back to Washington, who is um, in, around Quibbletown at the time. Tells him. The British on the march get back. So Washington sends orders to everyone to return to Middlebrook, which they basically do. Although an American, American under um, William Alexander takes up position in Ashwaub and, and attacks and is fought uh, by Cornwallis's entire um, division of about six, eight thousand troops, and um, the Americans are run off, but they hold. They hold Cornwallis from getting at, at, uh, at Washington. Cornwallis and, and um, Howe join up. They march into Westfield, basically tear the town to shreds, steal all the money, run off all the people, wreck the Presbyterian church. And the next day, they march off. They return to Amroy, to Staten Island. And that is basically the end of the offensive operations in New Jersey during this period of time. Now, Washington still doesn't know exactly what they're going to do. He still has the same fears. He, know, he knows now they're probably not going to march on him in Morristown, but he doesn't know whether they're going to move north, up the Hudson, or they're going to go south. So he's got scouts everywhere. At one point in time, he actually marches all the way up to northern Jersey because he thinks they're going to go up the uh, Hudson River. Now, at this point in time, there's another uh, column coming down from Canada towards Albany, New York, under uh, John Burgoyne, General John Burgoyne of the British. We're going to supposed to be cooperated with from troops from New York and from Baron St. Ledger marching in from uh, the east, or from the west, I'm sorry. Ledger doesn't make it. Howe leaves. So Burgoyne's on his own. And Burgoyne is ultimately defeated, of course, and surrenders at Saratoga. So Washington's efforts here in New Jersey have a profound effect on the Battle of Saratoga because Howe was supposed to cooperate with that, with that, and he doesn't do it. He moves off by sea. Washington gets word of that because he has spies all along the coast. Once they see the British ships turn south, they realize, OK, he's headed south. Washington then pulls all of his commands in, marches back down, recrosses the, um, the Delaware River, and heads to Philadelphia to begin one commit, one um, campaign ends, the New Jersey campaign ends, and the campaign to defend Philadelphia begins at that point in time. Now, if we look at this period and we look back at it, and we, re and we go back and we think about what were, what were Washington's objectives when he, when he first moved into Morristown, well, you'd have to say, number one, just simply to survive because he has no troops, right? So he wants to survive, keep the cause alive. Secondly, if he can, harass the British as much as he can. Maybe even, if possible, force them out of New Jersey. But that's a wild hope. But by the end of this period of time, he's done all three of those things. He's survived. He's 
He's kept his army alive. The third establishment is now starting to march in, and his, and his ranks are starting to swell, so that he'll have a, an army to fight with around Philadelphia. And, uh, and he's forced the British out of New Jersey after forcing them to suffer a heck of a lot of injuries and a lot of casualties and a lot of deaths. So for the Americans, they achieved everything they wanted to do. The British accomplished nothing other than losing a lot of men. And a lot of horses, by the way. They still have, when they get to um, Maryland, they have to send foraging operations out all over the place to get enough horses so that they can begin to march on Philadelphia. So that's basically my, my talk for the day. Um, that covers the, um, the, it gives you a good overview of what happened here. Does anybody, if anybody has a question, I'd be glad to answer it. Yes, sir. Do you feel that uh, Cornwallis and Howe uh, were incompetent or they weren't uh, wholeheartedly into uh, the war against the Americans? You know, it's hard to say. I yeah. mean, after, after the, um, they may be a combination of all three, right? I don't think that, I don't think that Cornwallis was incompetent. His, his attack on Boundbrook was, was Excellent, right? He overwhelmed it. You know, rarely if ever in warfare do you see someone have a, a nighttime march with three different wings, finding the, the, their jump off points at the right time and have an attack like that. It was a beautifully planned attack. I think a lot of it was arrogance, more than anything, that's my opinion. You know, nobody wrote a letter saying, you know, they, they, they couched everything very carefully. But I think it was just arrogance. I think, I think. No one really was really thinking we're going to lose this war unless we really think our way through this. The rebels are really good. I don't think I don't think they thought that. I think they this was a punch in the face. That's all it was. Um, the Boundbrook operation and everybody was thinking, well, we're going to win this thing. We don't really have to think too hard about it. I know that Howe Howe of course was the commander of the British um, field operation at the Battle of um, Reed's Hill and. Um, yeah, and, and they took an enormous amount of casualties there. And after that, I think that did weigh on him somewhat, that he couldn't afford to lose troops like this. Um, London's a long ways away to get crack troops from England. It's going to take a long time. He can't sacrifice men like that. Um, so it, I, it, it may have been a combination. I don't think it's incompetent so much as it is. Arrogance and, um, and yeah, I believe they don't want to waste their, they don't want to waste their troops. They don't want to waste them certainly doing this. He wants to get he wants to lure Washington out of that position. He can't beat them there. But if he goes after Philadelphia, he'll force Washington to come into the field where he can beat them in the open field, which is exactly what he does. Right? Yes. I just always been curious. Um, whenever I go to Trenton, you know, that time frame that you're talking about, I see the Delaware River, it's like the rock solid frozen over. Right. So during the time when Washington crossed over, I've always been curious. Is it, did they truly row over? Did they, were they able to walk across? Is no, no, they rowed over. Okay. They were rowed over in boats, and, and the river was freezing, was freezing farther north, and cubes of ice, large ones, were, right. were, were coming down. But they rowed over. They were, they were pulled over, basically. Um, and uh, they did it again. Now, when they went over again in early January, they tried to actually walk over in certain areas. The, the ice wasn't good enough, and they artillery collapsed into the river at that point in time. They had to pull it back out and uh, retry. Uh, but no, it was it was freezing hard at that point in time. It wasn't frozen over. Yeah. Yes, sir. Any insight to American casualties during this period of time? You know, casualties are very hard to come up with. And I'm using them fairly loosely because both sides reported it, and you would hear you would hear on uh, one side a, a small article would appear in a newspaper and say, uh, you know, the, the British were really roughly handled. The Americans attacked them. Um, they suffered 200 dead, 30 wounded, and then you'd see an article in a um, New York paper saying, the, you know, the British fought off the Americans, the Americans suffered 100 casualties. The best that, you know, I went with some of the accounts that I found in different texts where I had really uh, checked it out. I would say they're probably equal, in all honesty, um, except that the Americans were generally fighting um, a sort of a guerrilla style. So they would be attacking, hitting, and then marching off, and they could hit the British hard and then leave. Probably suffered a little bit less when it came to casualties. This enraged the British, I would say. Um, there were many times when they, when they did fight, the British regulars would go out and bayonet or club to death 
and the Americans that were left behind. They were enraged over what was going on with them. Yes, sir, does somebody else have a question? Yes, sir. What did the Washington do with the, the Hessians that he captured? Oh, and for that matter, anybody that was captured? Well, the Hessians that were captured, a lot of them were moved south towards Maryland uh, and, and Virginia. I know that some were kept clear out um, in Fort, was it Fort Franklin? In Frederick, Fort Frederick. Uh, that served as a spot to, to uh, keep a lot of the Hessians there. A lot of them were kept in the Virginia areas and put to work in those areas. Uh, so, some of them were exchanged, you know, it, when they could exchange. Yes, sir. Uh, two questions. Uh, after the Battle of Trenton, uh, Cornwallis was moving south and Washington was moving north. How close did they get together on their own power level with Cornwallis? How close were the armies? Okay, are, are you talking about the first Battle of Trenton or the second? The second Battle of Trenton. Okay, well, they got very close. Like, there, was, there was fighting at Trenton. Um, Cornwallis deployed around Trenton. He had his army there. They were fighting in the late afternoon that day. So they were facing one another right there at Trent, all right? And the Americans had battle lines, the British had battle lines. Had the British had two more hours of daylight, they would have attacked, probably overwhelmed Washington. That's how close they were. Did I answer your question? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, where did the Battle of Monmouth come in here? That was a year later, okay? After Washington moves um, south to defend uh, Philadelphia, he loses uh, at the Battle of um, was it Brandywine, right? Moves back, loses again at Germantown, loses a couple other battles that are half decent fights, but he loses them all. Goes into camp at Valley Forge, all right? And this is a period of vast improvement for the, for the army, even though it's a horrible winter. You know, von Steuben comes in and all that mismatch of militias that I was talking about. I mean, the Americans had different ways of marching and different ways of fighting of the different command systems. They couldn't fight together as units. Von Steuben comes in and changes all of that in a heartbeat, all right? And he comes up with this system of he trains 100 men how to march and fight exactly the way he wants them to march and fight. Then he sends each one of these men off to, to change different commands and teach them, all of his units, uh, how to march and how to fight, how to load their weapons moving forward, how to load them moving back. And so it has a, an enormous um, difference on the uh, Continental Army. And it's after they break camp at Valley Forge and they move up across New Jersey then because um, Howe and Clinton have, have abandoned, are going to abandon Philadelphia and move back to New York. Because Saratoga has happened, the French are now in the war, and the British realize they have to. Uh, protect a lot of their um, holdings in the Caribbean. So troops are going to be shipped out. They can't hold New York and Philadelphia at the same time. So Washington follows Clinton and Howe, uh, or, I'm sorry, Howe's gone by then. He follows Clinton up along New Jersey and attacks him at Monmouth Courthouse. Right? And it's here where all that training really does come into command. For the first time, the Americans really fight like an army and fight and stand up against some of the best troops the British have and send them packing. So it's a, a huge improvement. Um, and I mean, I, I wrote a, a book about uh, a battle in, this, in the South, a little known fight, um, where Daniel Morgan had troops and um, at the Battle of Calvin's, I don't know who's familiar with it, right? But it was a critical element that um, Von Steuben had taught everyone, as they were retreating, how to hold their muskets and reload them as they were marching backwards, all right? And during the Battle of Calpins, the American line is about to get flanked. So they move all the way up a hill, but the Americans have learned how to reload their muskets. They get to the top of the hill, the British think that the Americans are in utter retreat, and they start charging up the hill, and they get to the top, the command is given to turn around, and they fire directly in the faces of the British, then the command is given charge bayonets, and they send the entire British command running on its heels. It's an enormous American victory down there. And that's, that wouldn't have happened had it been not for Van Steuben teaching them the Prussian way of fighting, which was considered really the best infantry in the world at the time. Yes, ma'am. Um, I was just wondering, do you know at what point you went from Brunswick? 
falls under the continental control after this point because um, I went to Brockers New Brunswick and the campus that's called Queens College. Uh -huh. There's a site that's constantly referred to as like um, Hamilton's Battery of Artillery and it was supposedly a point of coverage while Washington retreated up the Raritan at some point, but I wasn't aware that it was ever under this heavy of British control. So yeah, it was under complete British control. Okay during this period. And there is stiff fighting in and around um, Brunswick as the British fall back towards Ambright. There's a lot of fighting in and around all those areas. Um, uh, there's, there are rear guard actions by and large allowing the British to fall back on Amboy. During this period of time, the British once again are enraged. They're burning homes all over the place, savaging people and burning everything in, in, their, in, their, in the rear view mirror, so to speak. Right, so but during this period of time as well, the, the mayor, you gotta realize the people of New Jersey before the war were living pretty amicably with one another. But a lot of different kinds of people, there was no friction to speak of, what to do locally and all that kind of thing. Now all of a sudden they're under British rule and they were treated very harshly. And this, um, people didn't like that. Free people don't, don't like all of a sudden having people come in, ransack their homes, beat up their husbands and brothers, that kind of thing. That was going on rather randomly, especially with the Hessians, who were very hard on the American people. So that flipped a lot of people into the rebel side during this period. Any other questions? Yes, sir. So I, it's about the Revolutionary War. We're not necessarily about this campaign. About the prison ship of Jersey. I've read stories about that that had crazy numbers of people supposedly dying on that. You mean in New York Harbor? Yeah. Yes. That yeah, on the East River. So, do you think that those numbers could be true? They probably are. They probably are. They were very, the British um, treated the American prisoners like um, swan. You know, they threw them on these ships. They had no food. There was all sorts of illness there. Um, they didn't care about them. To survive, you either broke out somehow, which was very difficult to do, or, or you died or you just had an enormously capable of metabolism, right, allowed you to, to live there. But they had a lot of ships like that in those areas. They threw a lot of people in, into them, and um, they were they all got ill. They were very poorly treated. And they, 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 they treated the American officers a little better, but not much better. All right, so a lot of them got ill, too, and, and uh, had illnesses that caused early deaths in their lives. A lot of men died in their 30s and 40s because of the illnesses. I mean, you can imagine the hardships. I mean, I, I read this through in this period in these marches. It's, it's hard to imagine that you're marching for two days without shoes on frozen ground. You know, I mean, I sleep in a warm bed every night. I mean, I, if I went and marched 10 miles, of course, I'm a little bit older now, but it's it's hard to imagine how men survived all this, but they did. They were animated to do it. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. I, I appreciate it.